behind me are the mountains of Telluride. And I took this picture a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's symbolic for me because it reminds me of my incident. It reminds me of the health that was restored, but it also reminds me of the one year anniversary of my incident when my heart stopped and I went down. But a year later, my wife and my two daughters and I, we visited the exact same spot on the mountain where I collapsed. We celebrated our industry, all our technology, all our technology, our advances, and the fact that I was still alive and my health had been restored. Uh, and we skied on the very spot that I went down. So this scenery to me means a lot. And I hope you can enjoy and share in that meaning. My name is Greg Garcia and I am an attorney. I've been an attorney for a couple of decades and I'm a former board member of AZ Bio. But five and a half years ago, I became a patient as well. I was skiing with my wife and two young daughters at the time. We had done a couple of runs. We'd gotten to the top of a mountain and suddenly I collapsed and there was no reason for me to collapse. I had no underlying health issues, but I did. I collapsed. I had no heartbeat and but for a host of angels around and some medical technology that I'll talk about, I wouldn't be here today. So it is truly a pleasure to share just a couple of minutes with you today. As I said, we were skiing. Uh, it was a wonderful day. We had skied uh, the weekend before. Uh, I had no reason to be scared about any health condition. Um, but when I went down, ski patrol volunteers and other angels helped perform CPR until an AED arrived from another mountain. And that was the first piece of medical technology that saved my life. They hooked me up to the AED and after three charges, they got my heart going again. Uh, eventually, I was taken down the mountain and transferred and flown to uh, the valley where doctors were scratching their head because, again, I had no underlying health issues. They did a host of testing on me. They couldn't figure out anything wrong with my heart. I had no underlying health issues, no heart disease, no blocked arteries, not even cholesterol issues. So they couldn't figure out why my heart was so weak and why it had stopped at the top of the mountain. Eventually though, after a lot of testing, they figured out that I had been suffering from a viral infection. I was asymptomatic. I had no symptoms that really would have caused any concern, none that I can remember. Uh, and in that regard, I was much like a lot of the present day COVID patients. And we were all suffering from the same thing in the sense that I had developed a case of viral myocarditis and it was acute. And a lot of folks that are suffering from COVID these days suffer from the same exact condition. Fortunately, I was at a good place with a lot of good people taking care of me. And I had the availability of medical technology, including an external pacemaker, which was the second piece of technology to help to save my life. And I remember waking up sort of uh, in the hospital and I was intubated. I couldn't really speak. Um, and I asked the nurses, even though I couldn't speak, the nurse knew, knew that I had a question and I was kind of gesturing towards this machine that was making this soft, quiet noise with a little beeping. And, and, and I kept wondering what it was. And she said, oh, that, well, that's just the device that's keeping you alive. And that was an external pacemaker that was telling my heart what to do and when to do it. Eventually, my doctors decided that I would get an implantable pacemaker for my good friends at Medtronic. And true enough to their mission statement, their device restored my health. After a couple of months of physical therapy and rest, I was back to normal and thank goodness came out of it with no permanent heart damage. And so it is truly a pleasure and a blessing to be here today with you to share this story and to celebrate all of the wonderful advances that our industry brings and to celebrate all the people like myself and the other patients that our industry touch and all the lives that we save. So thank you, thank you for all your efforts. Thank you for coming together today to celebrate. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Good morning. Um, I'm Joan Kerber Walker, and welcome to Voice of the Patient. This is the first of what will not be the last discussion with our patient community. At AZ Bio, we work to create life changing and life saving, saving therapies. But so often, we tell the patients what we're going to do for them. And today, we're going to listen to patient stories and hear from the patients on what they would like to hear and see from us. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's session, Renee Moomjian, and take it away, Renee. Thank you, Joan, for the introduction. And um, thank you to all of our, our panelists here today for um, sharing your stories. I know in, in some ways it, it, it can be difficult and we sure appreciate you um, showing up for this event. And thank you to all who are here to observe and be a part of this. Um, what I'd really like to see, and I, I think um, all of us would agree, is for all of us as stakeholders, whether we're a patient, healthcare provider, a device or a pharma company, that we walk away inspired, looking for opportunities to improve patient care. Just real brief about my background, I've been developing and commercializing medical technologies for about 30 years. I've always focused my teams of regardless where, what part of the organization they were in, whether it was the engineering, accounting, what have you, on what their role is and how it affects the patient. Um, so as far as my own personal experience in the healthcare system, I have a daughter who has had multiple medical conditions since birth and has required many different treatments. So I have experience with the caregivers, the devices, and the pharmaceuticals. And then finally, over the past decade, I have become very passionate about patient safety. Um, I've actually worked globally to change practices around feeding tube placement and can um, thankfully say that between a large working group, we've been able to make significant impact in improving patient safety um, when feeding tubes are placed. So um, enough about me, this is really about you, the patients. And so I'd really like to hear from, from our panelists. Michelle um, has multiple conditions, um, two primary ones. She's been living with um, cervical dystonia which is a rare neurological disorder and hypermobility, which is common, however, frequently misdiagnosed. So um, Michelle, I'm gonna turn this over to you to share your story. So um, I, similar to Renee, have been in the medical device space for nearly 20 years uh, on the regulatory and quality side. So I've always been passionate about the patient population and the people that I was helping bring mar devices to market for. But um, at the same time, my whole life, I've struggled with a variety of different symptoms um, that, you know, I went from this specialist to that specialist. Nobody was communicating. It led to years of misdiagnosis because hypermobility is a connective tissue disorder. So not only do my joints hyperextend, um, which can be painful because your body locks down to accommodate that extra mobility, um, but my, the tissue around my organs doesn't function right. So I've got digestive issues, I've got heart issues, I've got um, urinary tract problems, um, just basically any system that's reliant on your connective tissue to work properly does, doesn't always function reliable, reliably for me. And then um, on top of that, I've got cervical dystonia, which is a neurological condition that is misfirings of, uh, the electrical signals, it's, it's similar to epilepsy in that they tr use the same medicines to treat it, but it's, um, I don't have seizures, uh, but I have involuntary muscle contractions where I'll wake up with my hands and my toes clenched and my neck involuntarily, like just sticking out. It's ex extremely painful. Um, so I had been bouncing around from specialist to specialist since I was 28 years old. Um, and, you know, I went from everywhere from, you know, you either have a brain tumor or you're stressed out. Like a doctor really told me that. Uh, I was told um, at 28, having urinary tract infections every eight weeks, your body just does this now. And this is normal for you. Um, and it wasn't until probably about three years ago that I was uh, at a specialist for um, 
orofascial plane and pain and sleep management because I had TMJ so bad. And um, it was just a real blessing. My neurologist, uh, my doctor, who was a, a dentist that specialized in TMJ, was out for the holidays. And their own staff neurologist just happened to fill in for my appointment. He walked in, he took two minutes, he, like he looked at just my posture, the way I was sitting on the table, uh, my head was craned out and I was sitting in a really, unbeknownst to me, unnatural posture for most people. And uh, in two minutes, he's like, I'll give you this treatment, but that's not your problem. You're hypermobile. And he went down the laundry list. He's like, do you have this condition? 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 And it turns out all of my conditions fit within a single umbrella of hypermobility, but it's so it, it's more common than asthma, but it's not diagnosed because nobody is studying it because it's not a, a sexy disease. It's not a high, pro, high, pro, high profile and it's connective tissue. So it's not very fascinating to, to study in medical school. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite the journey for me. And because all of these are chronic conditions, it's really become, I do have medicines that help me manage them to a point, but it's very much a lifestyle um, of finding the triggers in my diet, the triggers in my activity that, that work together to either help me be healthy or work against me and will put me out of capacity for a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you know, thank you for sharing that story. And I, and we've known each other for a long time and I've been on that journey with you mm -hmm. and seen, you know, both the frustrations and now, you know, you getting some, some relief, but not anywhere where it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, and Matt Nelson, uh, Matt Nelson will be next uh, sharing his journey with, um, with MS. He was diagnosed five years ago. Um, and I'll turn this over to you, Matt, to share more of your story. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am Matt Nelson, as uh, Rachel pointed out. Uh, about five years ago, I was driving home and <clears throat> I noticed that the left side of my face had gone numb. Didn't really think much of it. I had a, a friend who had recently had Bell's palsy and I was thinking, oh, great, that just that's just what I need at this point in time. Uh, got home. It was still there. My wife was panicking, was thinking I was having a stroke. I was like, I'm not having a stroke. I just took my education modules at St. Joe's. It's it's only one symptom of many. Uh, ended up going to urgent care um, <clears throat> and explained my symptoms to them. They rushed me in, did a full workup, and they said, well, it doesn't, think, it doesn't appear like you're having a stroke, but we're going to send you to the to Chandler Regional and to their ER to have another workup. So they said, we could, we'll call you an ambulance. And I said, well, I drove myself here. I think I'll drive myself to the hospital. Drove down to Chandler. I was immediately on when I walked in the door, I was immediately on the PA system. They were trying to find me, um, rushed me back into the triage room, did a full workup. And they couldn't find anything wrong. Uh, they said uh, that it would be best if I see a neurologist. And they gave me some suggestions. And I said, you know, fortunately, I work at Barrow Neurological Institute. I can just walk across the street and talk to a doc and hopefully get this, uh, put to bed. A mm -hmm. um, couple of days later, I got in to see a doc at BNI and again, they couldn't find anything wrong with me at the time. I still had the facial numbness, but I didn't have any mobility issues or, or anything of that matter. Um, and I, I told them, I said, well, my wife's not gonna let me in the house if I don't come home with an order for an MRI. So they hooked me up, got into the MRI the next day. Uh, and that's when they found the, the lesions um, in parts of my brain. And uh, fortunately that's where they all are. Um, I don't have any on the spinal cord. Um, at which point they put me on five days of 
infusions, uh, steroid infusions to knock down the inflammation. Um, and then they put me on a disease modifying therapy called Gelinia. Fortunately, it's just a pill. Uh, and I've been okay ever since. I guess the, I always try to find some humor in it, even though it was, uh, it was, it was devastating news at the time, but, uh, <clears throat> I was told by my doc, don't get stressed out. Don't get overheated to which I laughed. And I said, well, you know where I work and you know where we live. Uh, it'd be great to have some, some ways to manage that. Um, and, and the ways I do that is I have ventilated seats in my car. It's a godsend. Um, and I, I pay a lot of attention to my stress level, um, so that I don't exacerbate symptoms, um, that I have, uh, that's really about it. It's been five years. Things are okay. I tolerate the meds. Well, that that's good. I mean, the diagnosis I know was very scary. I mean, for any of us, that'd be a very scary diagnosis, but it sounds like you've really, um, you've done well on the treatments that have come become available over the years, mm -hmm. which is, which is great. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, so the next panelist that we'll hear from is Julie Hoffman. So Julie Hoffman, um, you've been your daughter's number one fan and active patient advocate, re advocate, really helping her uh, through her journey and the journey you've had together with her autoimmune conditions. So, you know, I invite you now to, to come on and, and share that journey with us. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Julie Hoffman, and I am Chair of Advocacy for the American Diabetes Association uh, here in Arizona. And my now 25-year-old daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 18 months. And the only other person that I knew with type 1, I had been with just six months prior um, just hours before she passed away from a hypoglycemic incident um, in her sleep. So then to have our baby diagnosed with type 1, it was so frightening. Um, we started out on four different vials of insulin that we had to mix into the syringe and dose her um, three, four, sometimes five times a day. So um, that was very scary because microdosing an, a baby like that was was dangerous. And she did uh, have some seizures that, of course, I took uh, responsibility for, for giving her too much insulin or not giving her enough food. But thank goodness we have had a lot of improvements since then. Took her to child care that had uh, offered us a whole uh, another slate of problems because we found out really quickly that um, even school nurses, uh, child care um, nurses did not know much about type 1 diabetes. So I visited the school every day at lunch to give her a shot to cover the carbs for her lunch and filed a 504 um, plan with the school that would give her um, rights that she has as a student to participate along with uh, other students in the class. Uh, I worked in advocacy at the state capitol to get some of these safe at school laws passed and met with legislators and school board officials to see what we can do for other kids. Uh, my daughter thrived and then something else happened, another autoimmune disease, misdiagnosed with cystic fibrosis, and in fact, it was a pretty severe case of celiac disease. And then a few years after that, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She was diagnosed with uh, during the puberty years and went through high school with her insulin pump. Um, sports excelled in school. However, um, I cannot express enough the, the burden of multiple chronic diseases or autoimmune, uh, multiple um, autoimmune diseases, just the burden that is right beneath that veneer of resiliency. So as, as outstanding of a student and wonderful daughter that she is still to this day, 
they're just, and when you talk to her, you can see that she's thinking about the future and, oh, I don't want to deal with these. You know, I've got diabetes and I've got another newly diagnosed autoimmune disease that requires a specialty drug. So uh, she, thank goodness, um, carried that resiliency through college, graduated with honors, worked at the Disability Resource Center to help other students like herself navigate um, those issues at college and uh, is now um, a University of Arizona medical student. So. Wow. Uh, just come full circle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's been a rough journey. Um, you and I have shared a little bit. My, my journey with my daughter was not nearly that difficult, but, um, you know, really, you know, kudos to you and all that, that you've been through and helping her get to the place where now she's going to be able to treat others. Um, it's so, great. Yeah. Very proud. Of her. Yeah. Yeah. You should be. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for name. Yeah. So our next panelist is Pat Elliott. She's actually a multiple time cancer survivor and um, she's, she's now going to share you know, her journey and going through multiple treatments and where she's at today. And, and thank you, Pat, for, for joining us. Well, I hope I've joined you. Am I on camera? You're not on camera, but we can hear you, which is, I think, more important. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, bear with me. This is my second Zoom. I haven't been to Zoom school. I haven't been much any, anywhere since we hit the pandemic, but yeah. hopefully you can hear me. We can <clears> excuse you, so me. Don't worry, don't worry about the camera. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. We uh, can well, you. yeah, as a former television person, I do worry, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, we are here to talk about sci life science innovation from the patient perspective. Obviously, we can talk a lot about technology and the improvements that they have made in the patient's life. And in cases like mine, enabled us to live with diseases that used to be fatal. It's pretty remarkable. It really is. But just as technology has changed everybody who is a member of AZ Bio, uh, your work life, your environment, your ability to be on things like Zoom, et cetera. It has also changed the life of us as patients, which is something that I want to talk about today and hopefully share with you some news about things that you are not aware of. Uh, we have, unfortunately, a Hollywood version of cancer, which seems to be what most people think it is. Uh, when you get something like leukemia, like I have, people immediately assume that you're going to die and they call you things like victim. It's really, we're, no, that's not okay. We, we need to do things differently and I hope we will. Um, I had breast cancer when I was 35. It was found during an employee physical for a brand new job. I moved from Michigan to California to work for a national healthcare system. I had the best employee physical I've ever had, thank goodness and they found a mass. I then had a mammogram, even though technically I was too young to have one, and everybody kept saying I was too young to have cancer. Fortunately, I did work for a healthcare company, and their focus was on getting me through that, keeping me as a valued employee. I mean, they did pay my way all the way to California, and uh, it wasn't a big deal. They did not fire me. It is common right now, and especially in Arizona, to fire people after a cancer diagnosis. That needs to change as well. Um, anyway, I went through uh, the system of uh, diagnosis, treatment, and recovery, and then I hit my five-year NED, no evidence of disease mark, and kind of was able to just forget I ever had it, uh, which I more or less did, except for my annual mammograms, which I have to this day. I don't worry about it. It is not first and foremost on my mind. Um, what point was I gonna to get to? Oh, at that time, cancer really was not discussed in public. Uh, 
uh, Betty Ford, who I covered as a reporter in Michigan, Grand Rapids, uh, had made it public, but it still was not discussed publicly. There were no support groups. There, of course, was no internet. Uh, it, there really was, there weren't even uh, consumer magazines at that time dedicated to health. It just was not really talked about a lot. People were kept in the dark, including the patients who got things like cancer. As you can imagine, that's kind of isolating and kind of lonely. It's not a good way to treat people. Um, we also did not realize at that time, as we're learning now, that most people with cancer develop PTSD. Today, there are psycho-oncologists and things are very different. Hopefully they're, they're changing in many markets. Today, we're also realizing the after effects like cardiotoxicities and thus the need for support groups and for long-term follow-up and care for people who have cancer. All of this is new. But the good news is that we as patients are able to get this information now and to share it with each other thanks to the internet. We have support groups, we have online and in person. Uh, we have access to data and tools and expertise that never that did not exist before. And it's absolutely wonderful. In terms of my leukemia, which I like most people had thought was a childhood disease, I now know that 10 times as many adults as children get leukemia. That was a surprise. In August of 2009, I was working. I thought life was normal. It was hot in Phoenix as always. And I, one night was, I taught a class on LinkedIn for the Phoenix chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. As the night went on, my feet were swelling, my legs were hurting, I was in pain, but I kept thinking it's hot, this room is hot, it's Phoenix, it'll get better when I can sit down and rest a bit, but it didn't get better. It kept getting worse and the next day it was worse. So I did what a lot of patients do today and I went to, are you ready, <laughs> Dr. Google. Dr. Google told me that I had edema, which is swelling of the extremities, and that edema can indicate organ failure. So I drove myself to the ER thinking I would get it checked out and drive myself home. I was in for a surprise. Uh, in the ER, they took my blood and they came back out and said, your white cell count is 60 times the, what it should be. And we think you have chronic myeloid leukemia, but we're not sure it could be one of the other leukemias. We're really not sure. And we don't quite know what to do with you. So bear with us and we'll get back to you. Well, that was a bit odd, but okay. Um, my background, by the way, includes, um, I started working in hospitals in 1979. So I'm familiar with how they work, but not knowing where to put me was odd. They ended up putting me in the bone marrow transplant center, which was basically very brilliant on their part. It was the equivalent of going to an ICU for a blood cancer patient. And they said the reason that they did that was because of the nursing staff, because they had, it was Banner Good Sam. And at that time, the nurses had had 10 and 20 years of experience with leukemia patients. They were absolutely excellent. They assigned a hospitalist to me, which I understand is someone that looks out for the hospital. And the hospitalist very clearly had no clue what he was doing. That was disturbing. I contacted a friend of mine whose husband had passed from leukemia and said, where do I get information to understand what I'm dealing with? And she checked around and con got back to me. Um, and I had a laptop. The laptop was courtesy of a 16-year-old patient who started a foundation with his parents to give laptops to patients in bone marrow transplant centers so they could play games and wouldn't be bored. Bless his heart. I found the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I immediately learned everything I needed, not everything, but I learned about my disease. I learned what it was, what caused it, what the treatment might be, uh, that I probably was gonna live. That it was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. I talked to the nurses and they said, don't pay any attention to the hospitalist. You have a rare version of a rare cancer and he doesn't know anything about it. I appreciated their honesty and their frankness. And they said, 
you're going to get a hematologist oncologist and that's who you pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I did get one eventually and then I got another surprise. The next surprise was that my treatment was going to be a pill. The pill is, uh, the name of it is Gleevec. It is and was, still is the fastest drug that was ever approved by the FDA. It was approved in May of 2001. It was the first targeted uh, therapy for cancer. And the reason why it was able to be developed for uh, cell was because yeah. it's, a, it's a single gene mutation. Uh, am I over my time already? Yes, unfortunately, you are. Um, okay, so let, let me get, let me summarize very, very quickly. Very quickly. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I have a lot to say, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> in not two minutes. But anyway, uh, the difference that what difference has Gleevec made? Before Gleevec, 90% of CML patients lived two to three years and died. With Gleevec, 90% of CML patients live a normal lifespan and die from something else. Today, there are 1 million, an estimated 1 million people who are living with CML around the world. We are connected online through various groups and platforms, and I will go into that later if I have an opportunity, but just to say that uh, it was the first targeted therapy in pill form for cancer. Now there are many more, and there are many more cancer survivors than ever before. So there's a lot of good news out there, thanks to innovation in the life sciences, and uh, it's really appreciated. That's all. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Story. And yeah, you are going to have an opportunity here shortly to talk a bit more. Um, and so um, on that note, our, our final panelist that will be sharing his story is Lee Stein. Um, Lee really is an, an inspiring leader um, advancing medicine at the national and the global level. Um, Lee, you'll share more about this, but you and your family have had multiple rare conditions that you've dealt with, misdiagnoses, acute injuries. Um, you have three um, cavernoma tumors that are inoperable. So with that, I'm turning this over to you to, to talk more about. Thank you. And how many minutes would you like me to squeeze into here? Um, well, what we're going to do first, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you five to squeeze that into, and then we're going to actually go into a Q and A with, with each of you. So then you'll have time again to, to talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. And I'm going to try. So, so thank you everyone. Um, my family's history is rather unique. Uh, myself and every member of my family has had a very unique medical problem. Um, all of our case histories were deemed incurable in one way or another and all of us had to seek um, our own cures in, in a variety of ways. And um, quite, I could tell at the end of the story, we're all doing quite well with that history. And I can start off um, uh, by sharing um, a screen share here for a mo moment. Um, and uh, the first thing I'd like to bring up, did this article cured showing up, uh, Renee, on your screen? It is, yes. Okay. so. Um, this particular book was written uh, through uh, um, Harvard Brigham doctors and uh, um, MGT uh, doctors at Mass General. Uh, uh, they look at, this tells the story of my wife. There's um, television shows about her as well, but 45 years ago, she was diagnosed with a um, autoimmune disease um, that was deemed to be incurable and today she may be one of the most physically fit people that you will ever meet. Um, I didn't bring up a picture of her yoga practice, but it's on our family website, www.stein.to, uh, her story. But um, the, when the doctors told her that all of the joints in her body would fuse because uh, from her uh, pelvis up to her, uh, from her sacrum up to her occiput, uh, because of ankylosing spondylitis, she decided that if she moved a lot and stretched a lot, that she would be able to stay ahead of fusion. And so um, her story it tells that story. The TV show was recently done with her uh, uh, doctors. Uh, the next story um, is our son Skylar, and you can see that um, color graphic, Renee, is that up as well? It is, yes. Okay. And, and Skyler's story is um, he was at Harvard Business School and had to take a medical leave of absence because he was diagnosed with neurological Lyme disease. 
Um, and there were some doctors who denied the Lyme disease. Uh, but in uh, this particular case, what we did is we started an IRB study at the, uh, with Craig Venter, who had sequenced the human genome at the Venter Institute. And um, we sequenced his stool, saliva, and urine every Monday for a year. So we basically knew everything that was going in, into him and everything that was coming out of him. And this is across the bottom are the, the legend of weeks and these different colors represent different bugs in his microbiome. And this goes back to 2014. Uh, he was able two years later to go back to um, business school and, he's run, and he changed his career from private equity and energy to running a worldwide um, biotech uh, company that is eliminating things like eczema and uh, rosacea with topicals with a, a rather remarkable story. Um, my son, Spencer, um, basically had a sports injury. And as an incidental finding, um, he was diagnosed with having fractured his back in um, four places. And that turned out to be the luckiest day of his life. And the reason for that is we ended up doing a research program, again, an IRB uh, uh, research study, and this time at uh, NYU Biomedical Imaging. And this is the first image of a spinal cord uh, done with a seven Tesla magnet. And this was done in 2011. It was the only seven Tesla magnet in the United States that was even capable of doing it. And you'll see right here in the center is a, um, is a cavernoma um, that uh, was deemed by many doctors inoperable. Um, and I'd like to thank Matt for the work that he does at, Matt, at uh, Barrows because Dr. Bob Spetzler decided to take the chance on uh, this surgery. We found six doctors who we thought could handle it. Four refused to do it. Barrows told us a reason why Dr. Spetzler wanted to try it. Um, Spencer, they successfully removed it, but he ended up in neuro rehab having to learn how to walk again with chronic pain. And I'll come back to that and the medical devices that we wanna thank Michelle in particular that we've um, been uh, designing systems. And today, Spencer, at 11 months, the doctors told him he would never be out of chronic pain, but he should be grateful that he was ambulatory. And today he can lift 200 pounds and run 10 miles a day. And has been working with helping other people um, deal with uh, spinal cord and back pain injury. And um, the next one, I think this should come up here, is um, I was originally diagnosed, and my, case, my personal case history is written in the surgical of the Journal of Surgical Neurology in February of 97. Um, I was diagnosed as having a cerebral aneurysm of the post-communicating artery. And this is a peer-reviewed journal that had the chief of, uh, neuroscience, of neurology at Scripps Clinic and the chief of radiology at Scripps Clinic co-author as peer reviewed. And just recently we found that um, I had another, I had my own follow-up incidental finding that may mean that that particular uh, finding may have actually been inaccurate in that peer reviewed journal. And, um, so, but I'm doing quite well with, with, with it. My wife is amazingly strong and flexible. Spencer is completely out of pain, working with patients daily, um, helping them out of pain. And Skylar's running uh, this biotech company dealing with bacteria, gram negative bacteriophages to deal with antibiotic resistant um, infections. Um, and uh, so all of our lives were materially changed um, all of our lives were materially changed by, uh, um, our, by our medical conditions. And um, our, our, one of our, I ended up uh, serving on the board of the Scripps Health Foundation for I think it close to 14 years and shared the creation of its integrative medicine uh, site, or cleared the creation of the uh, community advisory board that enabled the, or helped facilitate the creation of uh, that center of excellence within the system. Um, and I also serve on the Preventative Medicine Institute Research Institute uh, with, that was founded by Dr. Dean Ornish after his work in reversing cardio cardiac disease 
um, was printed on the cover of the Journal of um, Cardiology and, and the cover of uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, because while at Scripps, we were one of the research sites for that. And today I serve on the Science and Technology Board uh, of the University of California uh, Medical System. And so it's been fantastic and uh, it's been a fantastic journey. And one of the things that we learned here is um, that we're very grateful to physicians for their diagnostic ability. But when we received prognosis that we just didn't want to accept that we went ahead and we searched for other solutions. Um, we find found that Michelle, as Michelle spoke, it was very touching because what we're looking at doing now is using computer vision and laser sensors to basically do what Michelle's doctor did. There are some doctors who can look at you and know exactly what your problem is. There are others who have not had the benefit of seeing enough cases in a particular condition, but with machine learning and computer vision, that tool is available resource for everybody or all physicians. So we're in the process of doing that. Matt, I mentioned is at Barrows and we will forever be grateful to the amazing care at Barrows on Spencer surgery. Um, he went in there with a very high probability of paralysis and came out with, with it. And Rachel, we do understand misdiagnoses because I'm living it right now um, with my second inoperable condition based on the same radiology. And um, so um, with that, we're grateful to be here. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned is, is that on these medical journeys with everyone here who has persevered, that the thing to really do is um, to look for the good in our situation. And if we keep looking for the good, we, we can find it. But if we don't look for the good, it becomes really hard to find. So we're um, in many respects appreciative for the medical challenges that we've had because it has defined the character of each member of my family and in many respects changed the, nature, the course of their lives in a very positive way. So thank you, Renee, for having me here today and thank you all for sharing your stories. Well, thank you, Lee, for not just sharing your stories but taking some really difficult diagnoses and situations and creating good, you know, you know putting you know, your leadership roles that, you've, that you have now in healthcare regulations here in the US and globally really truly making changes to save people's lives. We're gonna actually go now into some Q and A with, with all of the folks that have shared their stories. Um, and so Lee, since you're on- Renee? You know, yes. We're gonna try Rachel one more time. I think we've got Rachel audio fixed. Great. Well, actually, Joan, let's, let's I wanna ask Lee this question since I have him on and it just, it, I think it folds very nicely into um, wrapping up with him. And then Rachel, we will go to you, I promise. Um, so, you know, recognizing everything that you've been through and your family's been through and, and you're a true innovator. Um, what do entrepreneurs and innovators like you in healthcare need to continue innovating new technology and, and discovering more effective ways? I mean, it's unfortunate what's happened to your family, but you've turned it into something good. What do you think we need to do to get more of those stories out there and really helping people and making a difference in their lives? Uh, my first answer is having AZ Bio do more of these workshops so more and more people who are facing adversity could, could hear people who have figured out how to overcome the challenges. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to be doing more and more things with more and more people. Um, and in that line, the book that was written about Cured that my wife is featured in, they looked at about 500 cases of people who were cured of disease, clinically relevant stories, clinically relevant documentation, and to see if they could find a common theme among them, which they did, a number of themes. And they showcased those themes through the, the, the lives of eight different people, uh, my wife, Juniper, being one of those eight people as, as the way that it was showcasing those 500. Uh, the second thing that I think is super important with the, uh, the technologies that are developing, it's that you know, there are many um, um, established interests in the current healthcare system. Uh, the health, current healthcare system does some amazing work. We'll forever be grateful to the radiologists and to the neurosurgeons 
uh, that, that have uh, been able to do this pioneering work with our family, um, whether it's microbiome or um, neurosurgery uh, and so forth. Um, but I think we're at a point that there are so many new technologies emerging and that we're moving at the point of singularity of these computers moving so, so quickly and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning providing knowledge that's available, not only to people who go to uh, Dr. Uh, Google, as uh, Pat mentioned, but, um, um, but available to the physicians as well. Um, we just saw uh, technology that just spun out of the university that took mass spec from a refrigerator sized device that could do uh, one sample every two hours to now in a roll on suitcase sized device with robotics that can do um, 40 second analytic. And we're in the process actually today of basically using that uh, rapid sequencing for every blood cancer draw that happens at the Moore's Cancer Center. That's not, the paperwork's not completed on that, but donors have shown up to just start to find uh, molecules and indications that can never be found before these new rapid sciences. The digital health and digital diagnostics that are coming out of Silicon Valley and other places around the world because things are decentralized and distributed now uh, really give the opportunity to leapfrog over some of the entrenched uh, tech, uh, systems that have, you know, some of their own systemic uh, problems of access for people. So um, um, I think that just keep moving forward because we're at one of the greatest times in human history as far as the speed of innovation that's available to all of us. But if I could reduce it down to one single word, it's just look for the good, have faith that there will be a solution and just keep moving towards it. Mm -hmm. Even if you can't see it, you know, we're looking for solutions on the other side of the horizon. Problem is we can't see the other side of the horizon, but there are so many people who are doing a, a work and thinking on the other side of the horizon and bringing technologies and solutions back home whether it's in technology-based solutions, medical uh, molecule-based solutions with pharma, or just basic um, lifestyle changes, which are at the heart of many of these diseases. So yeah. thank you, Lee. Th thank you, Lee. Well said, focus on the good. And you've definitely done that many, many times. Thank you for everything that you've done. So um, Rachel Castillo, Rachel, have you joined yet? I know you're having some difficulty logging on. Okay, can't hear you, Rachel. You'll need to come off mute. You, you may be actually muted on the Zoom screen. Mm -mm. No, she's not. Can't hear her. Um, the, people are still having trouble hearing you, Rachel. So um, I'll just paraphrase what she said. So she was misdiagnosed um, for 15 years with lupus. And um, she, she was feeling like, you know, there's, there's something not quite right with my care. She ended up going up to the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, where they found that she did not have lupus. She actually had nephrotic syndrome, which affects the kidneys and required a kidney transplant. So um, Rachel, um, you know, had a kidney transplant back in 2018 has done remarkably well. Um, and, and after we get through all of the, the panelist stories, I have you know, some very, a very specific question to ask her um, that I think she'd like to share about her care and ways that you know, the life science community can improve um, the patient experience as they leave the hospital when they have not just a chronic condition, but such a significant medical intervention to treat it. So I am, Rachel, I, I did give a bit about your background. I don't know if you could hear it. So um, I'm going to ask you a question and, you know, if you could, I, I hate to ask people to do this, but keep it, you know, the answers to around a minute or so. So we give everybody a chance to share. Um, Cause I think this discussion, you know, as Lee said, is really important. We need to continue to talk about these things so we can continue to innovate and, and make a difference in people's lives. So with that said, Rachel, you know, recognizing that you have 
um, nephrotic syndrome, it's affected your kidneys. You had a transplant, sig very significant med medical procedure, life-changing. What type of support does someone who's just been through something that traumatic need when they leave the hospital? And did so to be con completely concise, um, this is something I've thought about for the last three years. It needs support between every piece of everything. And I say that to be pointed between the hospitals, between the medical, between the pharmaceutical and between any kind of equipment needed for that candidate, all three industries to be able to come together and support that individual and support that community. Because when you leave the hospital, the hospital says, peace out. I mean, for lack of a more professional term. Um, and it puts that patient, namely me, into a situation to figure out where you are at. Because when I came and went left work at Six Figures, managing huge teams in talent acquisition, and never stopping to work in 25 years, a year after transplant, I didn't know what to do and nobody to reach out to. So you are left with trying to figure things out, not knowing where to go and what to do. And there's nobody to help you. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. So when you leave, these industries need to come together to find a way to help. Mm -hmm. And that's because Medicare doesn't cover the insurance, you know, the equipment, mental health, there needs to be some sort of liaison between all three industries to come together, not to leave you out in the cold. Yep. Yep. Well said. More interconnectivity and communication with, with the patient. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. Um, Michelle, you know, with, with your situation with hypermobility and cervical dystonia, recognizing that they're interconnected yet, you know, it took years of seeing different physicians that couldn't make that connection. What do you think can be done to improve mm -hmm. care and better diagnoses? Well, for me, it's, uh, you know, and this is back to one of Lee's points about if the physician, if I had an observant physician that looked at this isn't normal, like what she's experiencing. And he had seen enough of it in his practice that he was able to diagnose me, but it's not taught in medical school. So until, and again, it's one of the most common disorders, more common than asthma. So until it starts becoming a standard of education, a standard of practice, people become aware, the, the extent of the diagnosis becomes more evident and accurate. Um, their industry being medical devices or pharmaceuticals isn't going to be driven to provide a solution um, because those industries are driven purely off market need. And with an uh, underdiagnosed condition, there is no clear market need. And further, it's a condition that most people were told we are hypochondriacs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe there's innovation even possible there with using AI for, for diagnosis when people come in and present multiple symptoms, some sort of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence that can come in and link that together and improve. I, I don't know. But, yeah. And you and I have talked about this is like, there needs to be more practices that are multifunctional specialists, yes. like not, not just you go to an endocrinologist and then you go to a different urologist and you go to a different and they're not all under one umbrella. They're not communicating right. that you miss all of these layers of symptoms and conditions when they're interconnected in many cases. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that actually leads me to a question for Julie Hoffman. You know, you, you'd mentioned one of your daughter's conditions um, was type of diabetes, autoimmune disorder. She has a Medtronic pump. Um, which you know, one company, sure, insulin comes from another drug company. Um, what, what do you, what suggestions do you have for these companies to collaborate outside of their silos to create a better experience for your daughter? Well, three things, and I'll read off my notes so I don't stray too far. But the, but the overwhelming with one theme of transparency, um, engage with patients listen to patients at every level so the startups that we've seen this week at az bio week um, 
they should have patients who will be the end users of the technology in discussions from the start. Um, and that goes for um, manufacturers of devices, pharmaceuticals, um, any other kinds of treatments, and also understanding that patient experience, those lived experiences are greater, far greater um, than an influencer that's Instagram worthy. Um, so all of the things that we heard from the panel today um, are, are invaluable. Um, and, and having said that, I would caution that there is an opportunity for AI to greatly enhance patient lives, but there's also the possibility that data overload without context of what we live is noise. And so um, there's some uh, things that can get lost in translation with, with data. Um, and the second thing I would say that um, the manufacturers need to understand that chronic diseases are often progressive and they're bundled as we've heard today again. But unfortunately we don't get a bundle discount on the treatments. There is no combo meal, um, you know, uh, discount with every 30 day supply. So when you add up the manufactured suggested retail price, the list prices of all of the things that we use, um, it's a tremendous burden. Um, and um, those things are imposed often by insurance companies, PBMs, uh, retail pharmacies, mail order specialty pharmacies that are owned by the same company. Mm -hmm. They're subsidiaries of each other. So patients are fighting um, for their treatments, um, devices and RX at every point along that way. And the last thing I'll say is join patients, join physicians, join the care teams in advocating for patient access. Without access to these innovative drugs and devices, there's no benefit to the patient. And as precision medicine um, becomes um, routine, um, it's even more incumbent upon all of us to work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, thank you. Um, I know we don't have much time. We're actually, you know, at the end of our time. I don't know, Matt and Pat, um, if you'd be each willing to just, you know, talk for for a minute, but Matt, I guess my question for you is, you know, living with MS, um, I think, you know, you, you've been it, it, not lucky, but you've been one of the lucky ones in that you were diagnosed properly, right? You know, pretty much from the start and had successful treatment, but what, what's, but you do work at Barrows, you see a lot of, you know, misdiagnosis, what have you, what's, what would you like to see improve in the, um, collaboration between um, industry and healthcare workers? Uh, wow, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, the one thing I did wanna say that <clears throat> before going down that road is that I, I think it's important for the patients to advocate for themselves. Um, if I hadn't insisted on getting an MRI <clears throat> for at my appointment, I might not have been diagnosed five years ago. It may have just progressed and gotten worse. Um, you know, the, the disease modifying therapy is, is a prevention therapy. So you don't really know if it's working until it's not working. And since I'm stable now, it does appear to be working, but it might not have been stable if I hadn't advocated for myself to get that MRI. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from a, a provider and a, in a business perspective, it seems like these autoimmune disorders do come in clusters uh, and, and people ended up, end up with multiple conditions. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, some sort of combination therapy uh, possibility that's given out that can treat these multiple disorders rather than having to take 10 different pills each day to uh, satisfy three, you know, symptoms that you have to treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that would take really, you know, cross collaboration between uh, companies, you know, not just within pharma, but also, you know, device as well. 
And yeah, so thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, and Pat, you know, you just briefly, you know, you went through an incredible journey beating cancer multiple times. How do you think life science companies can ensure, you know, with all the, the medications and things you've taken that you have the proper instructions and information about the products, um, you know, for patients like, like you? I think the life science companies need to do a better job of asking patients what they view as important and what they want to know and how they want that information to be delivered to them. Um, I'll give you an example of something that was done extremely well recently <coughs> that I encountered. I had a surgical procedure and I needed to inject myself with a drug for five days in a row prior to the procedure. I've never done that. The pharmacy delivered the syringes to me with basically no instructions. So what I did was I Googled the drug name and to their credit, the company had produced a video that showed a patient injecting themselves. Uh, it gave me the confidence. I mean, I, when I saw the syringes, I about freaked like what? But when I saw the video and I saw the patient actually do it in a calm way, in a supportive way and explain to me and basically take away my fears, um, I thought, bravo, I can do this. And I did do it and I did have my procedure and my pathology was benign, which was great and everything is good. So bravo to that particular company for doing that. But I think more of that, you, you have to put yourself in the patient's um, uh, mind and, and mindset and understand what we're looking for instead of assuming you know in my case with my cancer, a lot of the um, drug companies assume that on our minds is our lives were saved and we're overly grateful. Actually, what's on our minds is we have a chronic cancer and a lifetime and a life sentence of being on a drug and we wanna know how to best live with it. And we really want support as others have mentioned today, what we want is support for quality of life and for living with this. Yes, we're grateful. We're glad to be alive and to be here, but we want support. And that's where the AZ bio members could come in, in different ways. Uh, there's different ways they can support us, not just in the products they make, but by also supporting organizations like the Cancer Society, LLS, et cetera, locally, you know, help the community organizations, help the hospitals. God, they need help. We know after COVID, they really need our help right now. So there's a lot, all of us as citizens who live here and want to live here and want to enjoy the beauty and quality of life in Arizona can do to help our fellow residents. And I hope we will do that. What I'm saying in a nutshell, and I'm closing soon, is to partner with us, partner with patients, and we can make a difference together. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. And I, you know, I really, I appreciate everybody willing to stay on a little bit extra. Uh, I know we went over, but I think it's really important. This, this event is called voice of the patient, and it was really important for us to hear your voices and overwhelmingly um, they're, they're, they're heard, but not at the volumes that they need to be. And I think this is one of many events, as Joan said, that we'll be having um, to really make sure that the voices are not just heard, but, but um, people are listening and they're taking action. So with that, Joan, um, I want to turn this over to you. So first of all, I want to thank our patients. It, as the mother of a patient with a chronic disease, um, it's, it's hard enough to live the journey without having to share it. And so the courage of, you know, telling the story is very important. Um, Lee had a great point, which was that we need to tell more of these stories. And um, since you signed up for this event, you will now be getting AZ Bio in the loops. And on Monday, you will see the launch of a new page on the AZ Bio website called Voice of the Patient. And that page is specifically dedicated to patient stories. And so we encourage all of the patients, um, you know, to send us your stories and we'll put them on video if you don't have them recorded already and share them in that place. And then when I go to see the pharma companies and the medical device companies and the members of Congress, I will point them to that page and have them take a look at what you guys have to say. 
I want to thank Renee for being such a fabulous moderator today. Um, I want to thank all of our patients um, for telling their stories. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for having the desire and the interest to learn more about the patient journey. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you're enjoying Arizona Bioscience Week. Bye-bye.